Welcome to another episode of Scholars by the Sea, a podcast dedicated to interviewing some of the most interesting scholars and authors helping to shape our, our understanding of the past. For today's episode, we have in the studio as hosts Midshipman Andrew Beck, Midshipman Alexander Turner, and myself, Associate Professor Thomas Burgess. And today we are sitting down with Mike Tidwell, who launched his writing career with a riveting memoir about his years in the 1980s as a Peace Corps volunteer in the, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, entitled The Ponds of Kalambai, An African Sojourn. One reviewer noted that Tidwell's book is, quote, written with humor and anger, despair and awe. It captures many of the challenges and inspiring moments experienced by American volunteers in Africa, as well as provides deep and sympathetic insights into the causes and nature of poverty. Tidwell's other publications include Amazon Stranger, Bayou Farewell, and In the Mountains of Heaven. Tidwell has won four Lowell Thomas Awards, the highest prize in American travel journalism, and he now serves as Executive Director of the Chesapeake Climate Action Network. Welcome, Mike, and thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, I'm really happy you could come today because I read your Peace Corps memoir, The Ponds of Columbia, over a decade ago, but just in the past few years started assigning it to my students who find it absolutely fascinating. In fact, I, I haven't assigned anything to my students here at the Naval Academy that has grabbed their attention more than your memoir, so congratulations on that. Wow, that makes me feel good. And it's also very fortunate that two of my students can join us today to ask questions, but before they do, let's set the stage a bit. So can you please tell us why you joined the Peace Corps in the first place? Well, I was just a typical suburban kid outside of Atlanta, uh, growing up in the in the 70s, and um, I, I loved to travel. You know, my parents were big travelers, and uh, um, when I went to college, I actually met some folks who were in the Peace Corps. They sent recruiters to the University of Georgia, and um, I thought, wow, this sounds like a great adventure. Um, and honestly, my number one motivation for joining the Peace Corps was I wanted to experience a foreign culture. I wanted to learn a foreign language. I wanted all the excitement uh, and challenge of living overseas. And the altruism was sort of secondary. Um, it's like, okay, if I can join the Peace Corps and do uh, some good for other people, while at the same time having the travel itch scratch, then Sign me up. <laughs> well, we appreciate your honesty, yes, and I think you're thinking like many 20, 22-year-olds at the time. So, so what were you sent to do actually in Central Africa? Well, I tell people that I had the best Peace Corps job and the best Peace Corps location in the entire world. Um, uh, Peace Corps asks you when you join, are there areas of the world that you don't want to serve? And are there areas of the world where you have a preference? And since my goal was to go to the end of the earth, I, just, I, I wanted just the mo more exotic and isolated, the better. I, I listed, number one, Nepal. I figured that's the end of the earth, you know, live in the Himalayas. Um, and it turns out I learned later that Peace Corps, um, to, to keep trekkers from joining Peace Corps just to get over to Nepal, they, you automatically don't get it if you request it. So I didn't get Nepal. My second choice was Sub-Saharan Africa, and my third choice was South America. And so Peace Corps sent me to uh, what was then called Zaire. Today it's the Democratic Republic of the Congo in the very center of the continent. Um, and my job was to teach village people how to dig simple uh, fish ponds for protein and, and profits for individual farmers. That's great, and we'll get to that story soon. But one further question I have is, um, what did you find most surprising or amazing when you first arrived in Kalambay? I think I was not prepared for how difficult it was to learn a foreign language that is completely different than English. You know, it's, it's not in the same language family. There are no cognates, there are no synonyms. You know, there's just no similarities to English whatsoever. Um, and, you know, I was basically parachuted in with just four weeks of language training. Um, and so uh, did not speak the language very well at all when I got there. And it was, uh, it was one of the hardest things I've ever done. 
was to become fluent in a language and also to have no one, no one around who spoke English. So there was no one, there was no pause where I could revert to my native tongue for an hour or two in the evening. It was nonstop, which is the best way to learn a foreign language, you know, get thrown in the skillet. Uh, but it was, it was very difficult. Um, and uh, I realized that language really was the key to a lot of my experience because we think in language and there are literally concepts in Chaluba, the language I spoke, um, that don't exist in English. You can do a rough translation back and forth, but um, there are whole concepts and ways of looking at the world that you can only really learn by learning that particular language. And that was very, that was very gratifying. That's great. But you had some French, I guess, before you went over, correct? Or? Yes, I, I did speak a little bit of French and had a little bit of French training, but only a few people in my village spoke French, like the school teacher and a few others. Mostly it was just Chaluba. And, and among people who um, had never met someone who wasn't fluent in their language, you're talking about people who most of whom had never traveled more than 10 miles from where they were born. So they didn't know how to speak to someone for whom their language was a second language. So when I would say, can you slow down? Sorry, I, I can't quite, I'm new at this. They would just talk louder. There, there was a lot of frustration, but ultimately a lot of gratification. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Tidwell. I'm Midshipman Alexander Turner, and thank you again for coming. I really appreciated your, uh, your memoir, as I think here we don't often get yeah the same level of exploration. Uh, usually it's through a different sense. So it was a different look at travel and kind of in depth studying an area, getting to know an area, and then doing something of what you did. So I guess my question for you today is, were you able to convince uh, the villagers to build the fish ponds? And if so, what were some of the challenges you as the instructor faced, as well as they faced as potential fish farmers? Um, great question. Um, the technology that we use there was is called, you know, appropriate technology. You know, you can't you can't go into a village setting where, again, there's no electricity, there's no running water, there are really no roads, um, and you can't bring electric pumps, you know, or generators or sophisticated technology that no one could afford. Anyway, you want to teach a technology that could be replicated and that people could reproduce on their own. So um, we would build these ponds on the side of gently sloping uh, hills. Uh, we would divert a small stream uh, using a basic, uh, you know, level. Um, and you would get a, a, a small canal up on a hillside. And it was all gravity. Um, so no pumps. Uh, and through gravity... Of fed technology, you would then have the water flow into a pond that you would dig out of a hillside using a shovel. Uh, you know, all of my farmers uh, dug their, uh, their, their ponds themselves. They weren't huge ponds, but they still took a lot of work. Um, and then to drain them, you would just cut a small section out of the lower depth and make sure the bottom of the pond was higher than the valley floor so that the pond would drain completely through gravity and you would put a net over the the slice you put into the dike. So it was all gravity. It was all appropriate technology. We used bamboo, hollowed out bamboo poles uh, to get the water from the canal into the pond. Um, and uh, But it, it was a lot of work. It was pretty simple technology. We raised a fish called tilapia nilotica, so a hardy kind of tilapia, kind of a big sunfish that was found in the Nile River. It was it was native to Africa. It's impossible to kill them. Uh, you can take almost all the oxygen content out of it, and they're still happy. You can feed them almost anything. They'll eat anything. So we had a very hardy fish, prolific reproducer, so that once you had a pond, you could get the babies and use them to stock the pond the next time. Um, so it was pretty simple technology, but it was a lot of work. It was completely foreign to these people. You want fish, you go to the river. You don't. And I'm like, no, you can grow a lot more fish in this pond with a lot less work. So it was teaching those concepts and getting farmers to trust you. I mean, here I am, a 22-year-old white kid who speaks their language badly, um, who shows up in the middle of nowhere. And I said, trust me, move a ton of dirt with a shovel and you'll be glad you did it. I mean, it took a few real pioneering people farmers to do it first and then once a couple of them did it others would follow and then once we started harvesting the fish more and more people wanted to do it uh hi mr tedwell uh, my name is midshipman first class beck uh, i loved your memoir a lot it was a lot it was like one of the first times that i've been introduced to africa and honestly um same for professor burgess and his class 
I'm taking Weston the Modern with him right now, and it's the first time I've been introduced to Africa in almost any sense in any history class. So it was pretty exciting in that way. Um, going on what we were just talking about, you mentioned at one point how you helped one of the farmers dig the pond, and you talked about how backbreaking it was, and I thought it, w- it would be nice to just hear you talk a little bit about that because you said you were trying to convince people um, to dig these ponds, and you never really understood how hard it was, I think, until you did it yourself. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I wrote a passage in the book, early in the book, where I try to help the reader understand what I was asking of these farmers who were very, very poor, who were not super well nourished, um, and nonetheless worked very, very, very hard in the hot equatorial sun uh, to dig these ponds. And then I thought, well, I should I should do it too. I should pitch in. Um, and that's when I really realized how hard it was. Um, I mean, digging with a shovel is is unattractive work, it turns out. Um, and uh, I, you know, would see these farmers working at this every day, a few hours a day, every day after they'd already worked in their fields, they'd already carried water up to their village, they'd already done all the chopping and hauling and all the things they have to do in their normal day, all physical labor. And in addition to that, they, they decided, I'm going to dig a fish pond and spend two two or three hours a day shoveling. And I'm thinking, I can do that. I can. So I grab a shovel from my friend Ilunga um, and uh, start shoveling. And, uh, you know, I, I tell the story of how it was really easy at first. And, man, what, this is a piece of cake, you know, for about 10 minutes. And then, you know, you start to realize you're getting hot spots on your hands. Some blisters are forming. Oh, that's fine. I'll work my way through it. And then suddenly it turns out it's a really hot day. You hadn't noticed how hot a day it was. And now it's really getting hot. Um, and then, you know, the pain in your back and arms. And it's just really hard work. And, and I tell the story in the book of how I maybe shoveled for an hour, just, you know, really rigorously, and, uh, and, and was wiped out. And I, unlike my farmer friends, I was well-fed. I did eat protein every day. Um, I did have antibiotics when I got sick. And, you know, I was well taken care of. And it was still very uh, gut-busting work for me. And it really helped me appreciate just how hard life was for these people and how heroic they were to trust a kid like me and to do that level of work. Um, thankfully, they, they were all um, had good fish harvest after after doing the work but the fact that they were doing it on faith um just at first just completely blew me away and inspired me yeah you also mentioned uh the need for trust between you and these people but it wasn't always there right sometimes people suspected you or there are rumors that maybe you were taking the profits from these back breaking projects how did you get over that and where do these rumors come from yeah i think gaining people's trust was very hard. I think that the hardest thing for me was the language. Uh, And then on top of that, uh, as I was learning the language, I was having to prove to people that, um, one, I was willing to work hard. I was willing to revisit them and and be there to answer their questions and and travel a lot. I had a Yamaha 125 Enduro uh, dirt bike motorcycle that I rode every day across a 400 mile area, including putting my motorcycle in these dugout canoes and, and having them pull the canoes pulled across these rivers where, you know, one false move and your motorcycles at the bottom of a river. Um, so, and, and also I, you know, I got sick a lot from drinking the local water. Uh, but one thing that I realized was if you want to gain people's trust, you have to, um, you have to meet them where they are. And a lot of my farmers, they all drank palm wine, uh, a wine made from palm juice from a tree laced with local water. So Peace Corps tells you, oh, when you go out in the bush, boil your water, add iodine tablets and whatever. But here were farmers putting water into the palm wine, and there was no way to socialize with these men without drinking palm wine. If I didn't drink palm wine, they wouldn't trust me. They literally wouldn't trust me. What's wrong with you? Our drink isn't good enough for you. We've been drinking this our whole lives. So I drank the local water that way. And, you know, I paid a price. I got every known intestinal disease I think there is in two years. Uh, but I but I gradually, from uh, ad- adapting to the local customs, uh, socializing, and, and showing up and being there and working hard, um, I made th- friends the likes of with 
uh, the likes of which I've never had since. Some of the closest friends I've ever made in my life were were these village men with 10 kids and no shoes and the ability to work hard and laugh and and smart and um, truly inspiring people who are trying to overcome challenges that we'll never know, we'll never experience in the West. Um, and it really transformed me and impressed me and uh, f- has affected me my entire life. Wow. So, Mr. Tidwell, despite, I mean, as you've laid out, the most rigorous work you can do, uh, as well as trust barriers. I mean, in the memoir, you laid out a number of stories about kind of the different farmers and how they build these ponds. Uh, you were successful in getting a lot of people to build these farms. Why do you think, or why did they end up building said ponds? And additionally, kind of what benefits did they see from those? Were they feeding their families? Were they selling the fish off? Um, what did they get from that end? Great question. Um, in this book, I try to be brutally honest. You know, I talk about my own frailties, um, my own challenges. I talk about the contradictions of Peace Corps, um, sending someone like me into a village to try to tell people how to live their lives better. Um, it turns out people all over the world are experts on their own lives. Um, they do things for a reason. Uh, and it's not, and change is really hard. Um, uh, one thing that I discovered was uh, this was a really, really poor community. I mean, in two years, I went to about 200 funerals. Think about that. I went to about two funerals a week, every week for two years, um, most of which were for children under the age of five. Um, dysentery, malnutrition, poor water quality, you name it, a um, lot of suffering and death. Um, and uh, when people are that poor, um, you have to have kinship systems, families have to help each other, which means that you also share. You share everything. No matter how little you have, if someone needs some, you give them what you have, including food. So the first few times we had these harvests of these ponds, these Farmers had worked for, you know, had first spent two months digging these ponds and then six months of raising the fish. Now the fish are big. The pond's full of fish. It's time to harvest them. You're going to have fish to eat, fish to dry for food, and fish to sell for money. Take it to the local market. You're going to have cash in your pocket. Um, But the first few times these harvests happened, suddenly there were, you know, whatever, 50 kilos of fish buckets full of fish, more fish than people had seen in one place. Uh, and, it, and it belonged, in my mind, to this one farmer. He had done all the work, not his uncle, not his brother, but him. But then when the harvest came, the uncle and the brother and the neighbor all showed up with their hands out, give me some fish. It was time to share the harvest. And I was blown away by that. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, what incentive would anyone have to dig a fish pond and do all this work and, and, and raise these fish if at the, on the harvest day it all just disappears into the greater village? Um, so I had to start teaching them how to be good capitalists. No, you want to save this. You want, you want to educate your own kids. You, this is money you could put in the pocket to buy your kids school books and to buy them better food. Um, and it was a clash of cultures. It was a clash of worldviews. Um, and I had to learn that the sharing culture made sense. And they had to adopt, at least partially, the idea that I don't want to share everything. I want to keep some of this value for my immediate family so my kids don't die of dysentery. And that was an ongoing conversation and an ongoing um, difficult uh, part of my job. And, um, you know, and, and, and to the issue of sustainability, I will confess that years and years later, I, I don't know, I may help farmers dig like 100 ponds while I was there, and it was lots of fish being harvested. But then that question is, can this be passed on after you leave? Are people still going to raise fish? And the thing that I found even when I was there is that I could teach people how to raise fish and they did a great job. They were not as good at teaching their friends and transferring the technology themselves. Years later, this was like 2010, I was on Google Maps on my computer and I was dragging the cursor like from one place in North America to the other for a trip. And then I realized, man, I could drag this cursor to Africa 
and I could zero down on all the satellite maps. I mean, I zeroed down on my hut that I lived in all these years later. And then I thought, wow, I know every path. I know every stream valley. I know. And I literally dragged the cursor and followed to where the, I knew the fish ponds were. And I get to the first batch of fish ponds that were nearest my house. I could see them. I could see them from outer space. They were these indentions that look almost like caterpillars of squares. Not one of them had water in them. And then I went to another valley and I looked at, there were 20 ponds over here. Not one had water still in it. And then of all my searching, I found one pond that still had water in it all these years later. So, I mean, that's proof that this technology, while it was a great experiment and I had an amazing time and I made great friends and people raised fish for several years while I was there and afterwards, but 30 years later, they still, they weren't using the pond. So that was kind of a, a gut punch. Um, and, you know, as a development worker in, in a poverty-stricken area, you learn that, one, change is really, really hard. And if poverty was easy to solve, it would have been solved a long time ago. It turns out it's really hard to address poverty. It's really hard to lift people out of poverty, not just in Africa, but here in the United States and around the world. There's no simple answer. Um, and that was one of my lessons. Yeah, and going further, you talk about the prevalence of post-colonial corruption and negligence, how bribery is a very common fact of life. You talk about the prevalence of disease in this part of the world and the lack of education, health facilities. There's a lot of factors here that you sort of present to the reader. Uh, and then there's one scene where you're trying to convince the villagers to have fewer children. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I mean, we, we have a, frankly, ignorant, outsider's view of family size when we look from the West to cultures like this in Central Africa. Um, to us, we just assume that anyone would understand that the fewer kids you have, the less food you have to raise, the less money you have to generate to send them to school. Uh, but the reality is people have big families for perfectly logical and appropriate reasons in poor communities. It's a form of social security for older people, of course, and also because of the prevalence of disease and death, you don't know how many of your kids are going to survive. Um, and that is a big um, motivator for people to have big families. Um, and so when I got there, it was like, well, if you raise fish and you increase the amount of protein that your kids are eating and you have more money to buy them clothes and, and medicine, you won't have to have as many kids. So if you use this development technique of raising fish and having fish ponds, um, you can relieve yourself of the burden of having so many kids. And that was just a really fraught argument and conversation that, you know, ultimately I just gave up on. Like, it is not for me to tell people how many kids they should have. It is for me to maybe impart uh, some small, simple technology that might help them feed the kids they do have. But th there, there was no, there was no greater motivating life force in this culture than have as many kids as you can. And the only thing that really interrupts that, if you look at cultures like in India and elsewhere, family sizes decrease, not necessarily based on how much wealth you generate. Wealth helps, more food helps, but interestingly, the number one factor in reducing family size is female literacy. The more women are educated at a young age, the more they can start to make decisions for themselves that are appropriate for their families, and that tends to lead to fewer children. Urbanization is also an important factor as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's great. So I just want to add that one of the great values of your memoir is that it really speaks to these ongoing debates among scholars, especially especially sociologists, about the sources of poverty or the causes of poverty. And you have one group called the structuralists who basically argue that um, to even talk about cultural matters is to quote unquote blame the victim. Then you have culturalists who are saying actually culture does matter. We, we can talk about it. It's morally permissible to do so. And in fact, cultural and structural factors are sort of entangled in any kind of analysis. You can't really disassociate the two. And, and I think your memoir kind of speaks to that. In fact, when I asked my students after reading your book, how many of you feel that poverty in this part of the world is a combination of these two sets of factors, like almost all raised their hands. It's like above 90%. So 
I find that rather interesting. So, but you were saying before that they, you know, the, a key truth in their life or a key principle guiding their conduct is the desire to have large families. And so they maybe have a different standard of what is poverty and what is wealth over there that is different from ours in the West. Can you speak to that perhaps? Yeah. I mean, if you don't have a lot of children, um, you're insecure. <laughs> um, but having a lot of children makes you insecure also. Um, there is a common response when you asked people, how are you doing? It was always, how are you plural doing? Even if you're encountering one person, you would say, how are you plural doing? How are you and your family doing? Um, and if you have 10 kids, somebody's always sick. <laughs> you know, somebody's always sick. So a common response would be, we are suffering. Tutti tukanga. We are suffering. Um, and that was a very common response. And that, you know, so having a lot of kids creates a lot of suffering uh, because someone's always sick. Uh, but the alternative of having fewer kids may mean that you have no one to take care of you when you're in old age. So it's sort of a trap and it's complex. And I just reached a point where I was like, I, I can't do anything about it. I, it is not for me to figure this out. It is what it is. Um, and, uh, I'm just going to try to tackle the things I can control. Yeah. Um, so on the topic of individuals, like people that you talk to all the time, um, do you do you know of any currently who are trying to or who tried to escape that poverty? And um, can you tell us some of their stories, like maybe how you've helped them or how they managed to get out of it? Um, or even some stories about people who maybe never managed to get out and maybe are a little bit of a sad story? Um the country of the Democratic Republic of the Congo is as poor or poorer today than it was when I lived there. Uh, there's been series of civil wars. Um, there's still no roads. I think 1% of the country is electrified. I mean, it's it stands out as one of the, you know, if you, you see those global maps of the world at night and the electricity grid and you see that dense New York to Washington grid and then you see what is this in south america oh that's the amazon dark you know and then you look at central africa the whole congo basin is is dark there's almost no electricity um and without electricity uh and roads you can only <laughs> you're going to stay relatively poor now if you're uh, rainforest people uh, like the Bantu pygmies of uh, Central Africa. You can live in a world of environmental abundance without electricity. Some of the most healthy people in the world and happiest people in the world are rainforest dwellers in the Amazon and, and, and the Congo. But if you're an agricultural society uh, and you have no electricity and running water, uh, you're, it's hard to get out of that poverty. Um, and so uh, most of the people who I knew and I lived with and who were my friends and contemporaries in Zaire are now gone. They're, they've, they've died of early, you know, the life expectancy in uh, the, the Congo is like 48 years. Um, so most of the people I knew have passed away. Um, I'm still in touch with uh, one of my friends, Kayenda Langa. Um, had a baby his wife one of his three wives had a baby right like two months before I left I showed up in his village um, he was a very good friend of mine had a lot of fish ponds and he said Mike come here I gotta show you something and we go back to one of his huts and there was his wife who I knew was pregnant holding this beautiful young baby and he said um, there's an expression uh, and it's a big deal when people have the same name and he said this is your Shaken and Shaken meant this is a person who has your same name. And he had named the child after me. Um, I went by the French version of Mike when I was there, which is Michel. And he said, this is Michel, little baby Michel. Well, years later, when cell phones finally penetrated even this isolated area, um, a, a then 30-year-old young man named Michel started calling me. And he had moved to the capital. And he said, I'm the son of Cayenne um, and uh, we are still in touch. And because there's no banking system there, I tried sending money to some of my best friends and my, my domestic, who was one of my best friends. And, uh, it, it, you know, the Army would steal your mail and take all your money or the Postal Service or whatever. It was just almost impossible to 
try to send money in a supportive way over the years. But this this kid, Michelle, was living in Kinshasa, the capital, and so I could wire money through Western Union. So my wife and I donate to his family every month, and that is the, the final legacy of my Peace Corps experience is one family in one city in the Congo gets monthly assistance from us. It helps his kids go to school. Um, and uh, in terms of the others, they've either passed away from – from illness and disease, um, or they're they're quite old. They still live in the same type huts, in the same isolation, the same dirt paths, the same lack of electricity, the same level of poverty. Yeah, along those lines, I'm just curious. Do you know about the fate of Kalambai, this region where you served during the wars of the late '90s, early part of this century? Because this is this is one of the most chaotic parts of the world for for several years there. I'm just curious, was this a war-torn region that was afflicted like other parts of Zaire or the Congo? Or It was not. Um, the, most of the, the real suffering and fatalities in the Congo Civil War were in eastern Congo that borders Rwanda. And, uh, you know, the, the, the Congolese Civil War was sort of an outgrowth of the genocide in Rwanda, um, where lots of refugees came into eastern Congo and— you know, these are all failed nations, and so there was just lots of power grabs and in instability um, that that led to instability across the country. But most of the fatalities were in eastern Congo. Uh, but the 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 loss of life from just the the wrecked economy and uh, the the extremist uh, dictatorial government had consequences throughout the country, including where where I live. So it, it's just, it's a, it's a failed state. And in a failed state, people are poor and there's not a lot of functioning education and opportunities for women and opportunities for improved health. Uh, and so in that way, the suffering as a legacy of the civil war goes on. Um, to kind of make a shift here into more of your time in Columbi, um, can we talk about how hard it was for you to adjust the language? Um, did you have a moment where all of a sudden you could understand the people or was it a slow process? Um, learning Chaluba was one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. Um, again, it's a very interesting language. Uh, it, it's a language where um, all the verbs and adverbs and adjectives um, have to conform to the noun in a sentence, and all the nouns have prefixes. And so, for example, um, a, a banana is chibota. Um, that means one banana. Uh, plural, bananas, is bibota. And so when you add these prefixes to the noun, then everything else in the sentence has to conform to that prefix. So, for example, if I wanted to say that one banana over there is very good, I would say chibota cha cha chidi chimpa cha dikema. If I wanted to say those bananas over there are really good, I'd say bibota bia bia bidi bimpa bia dikema. You know, and if I wanted to say that that hut over there is good, I'd say Lucana Loa Loa Ludi Luimpa Loa Dikema. So it's just this slur of prefixes. It's complex, hard, um, and uh, it was tough. So to answer your question, was there a moment where I finally got it? No, it was just a gut busting daily sort of getting acquainted with the language. But I do remember after I'd been there for like three months and so frustrated and think I'll never understand these people. Um, because like when I got there, I was taught like missionary Chaluba from the Peace Corps, like the equivalent of, hello, how are you? I hope you're well today. And then let's say you're airlifted into rural Alabama, you know, where someone says, hey, what's up? You know, how y'all doing? You know, because that's that that was the difference between the formal Chaluba I learned and the rural country Chaluba that was spoken. It was very hard. But to, after about three months of just being worn out by this language and having to study it at night and feeling like I was never going to make progress. There was this one villager who I who had stopped me along a road and said, I'd like to build fish ponds. And I'm like, yeah, great. Um, let me know when you're ready. And it turns out a couple of months later, he was walking past my house off on a, a voyage to visit a relative miles away. And he came by my house at like five in the morning. And he thought it'd be a good idea to check in with me at five in the morning. So I hear this, someone knocking on my door while the roosters are crowing. 
and it's still dark out. And I open my door, bleary eyed, and this guy starts speaking Chaluba. And he's like, remember me? We met two months ago and I'm on a trip to visit a relative. And I remember thinking, I understand what he's saying. Because I think I was just so, you know, my mind was uncrowded. I just woke up. The thing is, when you learn a foreign language, the first several months, you're translating in your head. You know, you tell me something in Chaluba. It goes in my head. I'm translating. What does it mean in English? I understand what it means in English. And I translate it back and speak Chaluba back to you. You, ha you have to reach a point where you're not translating anymore. And that, I remember that. I remember that guy at five in the morning just speaking rapidly and a wide range of things he was saying. And I was standing there and I really remember, my God, I understand what he's saying. And so that was sort of a breakthrough. Now, by the end of the two years, I mean, I was fluent. I could identify even the smallest little tool outside of a house, some obscure tool. I was dreaming in Chaluba. I could insult your mother in Chaluba. Um, and I had an experience where every day I was speaking a lot of Chaluba. I was speaking a little bit of French every day. And I was reading because there's no electricity. The whole village went to sleep at 7 o'clock at night. And I had a kerosene lamp. And Peace Corps volunteers famously read, read, and read, and read. So every night I'd read for two hours in English. And I remember right before I was leaving, I had a shortwave radio. Um, that I would check in, listen to the BBC World Service, maybe Armed Forces uh, Radio, which a lot of people overseas listen to U.S. Armed Forces Radio. You can listen to a football game on your two-way radio. And uh, I was toward the end of my service. I was just a month or two from leaving. I'd been speaking these languages for two years. And I turned on my shortwave radio, and I was trying to find an English language station. And, you know, there was something in French, something in Arabic, something in Lingala. And then I was like, ah, I couldn't find anything because of atmospheric conditions. And finally, I found an English language station. And I set the dial there and I go back to, you know, cooking over an open fire, cooking my dinner. And I'm listening. And then I stopped for a minute and I was like, wait a minute, is that, is that English? And there was a moment of this panic where I was like, it sounds like English, but why am I not understanding it? And I think my mind didn't have a base language anymore. And it turns out it was Afrikaans from South Africa, which can sound sort of, you know, English. Um, and I just remember, dude, you need to leave, man. I don't even have a base language in my head. But I had gotten to where I was totally fluent in Chaluba. And that's what happens when you're completely immersed. And, and as a result, you know, it's, it, it expanded my mind because, as I was saying earlier, there are just concepts that you can only truly understand if you speak French. You know, there are concepts in English that you can only truly understand if you speak English. You can do a rough translation. And there were just so many concepts in Chaluba that in, in Bantu culture where I live that I could only truly understand. For example, the word literally for hope in Chaluba is Mujingila. Uh, but it means so much more than that. It, it means... It's, it's hope, but it also means the kind of suffering that comes from hoping. Um, and so it's not a totally positive word. It's a, it's a sure, sure, hope, sure hope I can count on this thing, but it's probably going to disappoint me because there's so much struggle in that culture. So it, it, th that's a concept that I never would have understood if I didn't truly speak the language. And that was really enriching for me. So, Mr. Tidwell, in your no memoir... Um, without giving too much away to the listeners, you have these two distinct, distinct scenes in beginning and end where you kind of dust out your father's old blue Air Force bag, look at it. And for me, at least, when I read it, I equated it to the beginning and end of your Peace Corps career. Uh, so from that kind of Peace Corps career, what would you say, like, one lesson you really left having learned, um, if there is such a lesson, a lesson? I think that among the many ways that my two-year Peace Corps experience changed me and it was the two most formative years of my life it still affects me profoundly changed me um, but I think the number one thing I took away from it was a very powerful sense of justice um, it is unfair that there are people on this planet who live on less than a dollar a day it is unfair that there are countries where the lifespan is 48 years um, when we live in abundance and when we've helped cause some of these problems. 
Um, so I came away with that and a sense that we need to be better global citizens in the United States. But in the years since I left Peace Corps, 1987 to the present, there's this other global issue that has come into focus, and it's climate change. Um, we all know the basics of climate change. The U.S. military has acknowledged that it's a real thing uh, and that it's a force multiplier for the U.S. military um, because it will destabilize countries. It is destabilizing countries and causing chaos, ecological and social. Um, but for a country like the Congo, um, you're talking about uh, people for whom it's not a question of clean wind-powered electricity versus dirty coal-fired electricity that's causing climate change. They don't have electricity. It's not dirty gas guzzling Hummer versus electric Tesla. Those aren't choices for them. They have no cars. You're talking about people who've generated almost nothing in terms of global warming, are utterly innocent, a continent of almost a billion people that generates about 3% of the world's greenhouse gases. Yet, they are suffering as we speak from climate change. Where I lived, and I talk about this in the book, there were two rainy seasons. And those rainy seasons had to come on time. There's no refrigeration. There's no storing food. You grow the food. You dry it out. You put it in your attic. You eat it. You ration it until the next harvest. Um, and if those rainy seasons show up late, um, it means hunger. It means immediate hunger. And now we're disrupting all the precipitation patterns all over the world, including for people who are totally vulnerable um, and are made hungry by that. And I just believe that is totally completely and morally unacceptable and that our country needs to do more, not just to address conventional poverty, uh, but to deal with this issue of climate change, which the United States historically is driving it. I mean, we're 5% of the world's population. We generate 25% of the world's greenhouse gases. And in a perfect world, in a fair world, we would get 25% of all the world's warming just telescoped right down on our country. And if that were the case, America would already be destroyed. You know, Florida would already be a series of islands. Kansas would be a scrub desert. We would be wrecked as a country if we got our fair share of the warming that we create. But since we can share the warming with Bangladesh and share it with the Congo and share it with South Pacific island nations that are literally going to disappear from sea level rise, we tend to be okay with it in the United States. And it's, it's just wrong. And uh, so I've devoted the second half of my life to the issue of climate change in great part because of the people of Columbia, because I saw how they live. I came away with a powerful new sense of justice. And now I see their lives are literally threatened by climate change and we have to stop it. Well, thanks for your work on climate change, and thank you for joining us today, Mike. Look, it's been a real pleasure. It's been an honor to be invited here on campus and to spend time with you all. I really appreciate it. And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Scholars by the Sea. We hope you liked what you heard and want to join us again. From Midshipmen's Turner and Beck and myself, goodbye. This has been a production of the History Department at the U.S. Naval Academy, located in Annapolis, Maryland. If you enjoy our programs, please let us know as we'd love to hear your thoughts. You can reach us on Twitter and Instagram at USNA History, and our email is historyproductions-group at usna.edu. For more information about the History Department at the Naval Academy, please visit usna.edu history.